Well, if you would, let's turn our Bibles to 1 Timothy. We're going to first start in chapter 1. Um, today, we are, once again, session number four in our The Mystery of Christ series. Um, I think so far that, that we have uh, really seen just how truly rich of blessings that we have in this dispensation of grace that you and I live in today. Look at how far you've come. I'm able to just now use words like dispensation and, and uh, the mystery of Christ, and you're just tracking right along with me. Um, if you haven't been with us, uh, we actually have our sermons or our studies. Uh, we had a few technical difficulties like we're having today. Uh, the camera's not working. Um, by camera, I mean my cell phone. And, uh, but you can access uh, those things online. Just come up to me later and I can, I can help you with that. But today we're going to be looking at a particular verse in uh, the book of 2 Timothy. But I want to give you a little bit of background, a little bit of context before we just jump right off into it. Um, so, so with that being said, I have a few passages we're going to read, but we're not going to be focused on just a particular passage of verses. So uh, I don't have the ability to just stand up and have us all read a passage together. So how about I open up in a word of prayer and we just jump into it today. Lord, thank you so much for this day and this opportunity that we have to gather here, Lord, to study your word, to praise you, Lord. As, as Jerry's saying, we, we just, we imagine that day, Lord, that we will see our Savior, the one who died for us face to face, and what an amazing day that will be. And we can look forward to it and have assurance, not because of our own laboring, our own works, but by faith in what He has done. So it's in our Savior's name, Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Amen. So in the letters of First and Second Timothy, uh, Paul is giving instructions to his young pupil, uh, Timothy, who is really the overseer, even though he may be young, he's the overseer, bless you, of the churches, uh, the church at Ephesus. And so Paul, is, it really gives a lot of important instructions. I think so much of, of instruction for church conduct that you and I have today is we kind of are going to look through some of these. You're going to see, oh, we get these from First and Second Timothy. And um, we've been studying Paul's writings, and especially Ephesians chapter 3. That was the start of this whole series, this mystery of Christ. And in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul really just gives, I would say, earth-shattering news that God is doing something new. He has put in place a new dispensation, this new house rule by which, I mean, we live in an age of grace. Whenever we look at years past, Israel, of course, had the law that they were under, but you and I are not under a law. We're not in the covenant of Israel. This is something entirely outside of that, that you and I come to salvation not by works, not by the covenants that God made in the past with Abraham or Moses or any of these things. You and I come by trusting in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And Paul uses an interesting word for this. It was a mystery. It was hid in God in previous ages. That is then, uh, in the time of Paul's writing, was then made known unto Paul. And Paul had this ministry. He had this obligation given by God to let the Gentiles, the nations, know of this new dispensation that God had put in place. So I just want to give you a few things that, that we get from, from the books of First and Second Timothy. So much of it is just so important to us um, today in this age that we live in. First Timothy chapter 1, verses 4 through 7 um, Paul gives these instructions to uh, young Timothy. He says, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions, rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. So do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart, and of good conscience, and of faith unfeigned, from which some, having uh, swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling. Once again, the King James lets you use fun words like jangling. And today I'm actually going to build a case of hopefully why maybe after this you go out and buy you a King James Bible. But uh, that's a bonus. We get to say words like janglings, vain, vain rants, vain words. Verse 7, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. You ever know any somebody who, who talks about something that they know nothing about? <laughs> Paul says to Timothy, avoid these pointless things. We're built upon faith. We're not built upon the law. Pointless uh, genealogies and pointless sayings, pointless fables. 
in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 through 7, so just I'm on the same page here, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus, uh, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I would say that that would be faith and truth. I think maybe if you, if you had to pick three verses back to back to back that maybe present the gospel um, in the best way, it might be those three right there. Uh, that, that Christ is the mediator between God and man. And Paul comes to teach the nations in faith and in truth. And this is the truth, that we are saved by grace through faith. Whenever we go over to 2 Timothy... Um, you really see a lot of, of things that uh, you and I should be very well familiar with. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, Paul said, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in it. Don't be turned aside from the grace gospel that you and I have today. Don't be deceived to believe that you've got to incorporate the law, works in any way. Be strong in the grace of God. Um, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. I think that's an important thing. It's something that the churches have fallen short on, that we need to commit faithful sayings, the word of God, sound doctrine to faithful men who can teach others. The, the preachers need to be doing a, a, a good enough job of teaching the Bible to where the men listening can go teach. Some of you youngins too. I see you. I'm making eye contact with you back there. We're raising you up. We're trying to train you up in the Word of God. We need the next generation to continue on carrying the torch, standing for the gospel of salvation by grace through faith. He also goes on, verse 3, um, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of, Christ, uh, of Jesus Christ. Probably whenever we wrap up our Mystery of Christ series here in several years, uh, maybe I might be able to cut a little bit shorter than that. We're going to talk about Really, the, the church has lost its identity as Christian soldiers. Uh, some of the hymns we used to sing, we're going to work on that. We're, we're going to bring them back. But used to it was, you know, we're, 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 we're marching to Zion. We are, we're, we're onward Christian soldier. A mighty fortress is our God. We've kind of lost our identity. Used to the church was, was a tough force to be reckoned with. And now we're maybe not quite as, uh, as tough as what we once were. He says, verse 4, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Don't forget your identity as a soldier in Christ. We need to stand firm on the gospel and proclaim it. You can also go to chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, where uh, we get in, um, instructions uh, concerning the importance of the Scriptures and studying God's Word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. He's talking to Timothy here, so we always want to pay attention to context, but I think we would extend this to us. Uh, I can imagine I've got Joy right there, and Evan, I can imagine that you spent a little bit of time teaching young Evan in the ways of the Bible and such things. <laughs> verse 15 as we go on this says uh, and from a child that's known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus verse 16 all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness um, verse 17 that the man of God may be perfect thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The Word of God is to equip us, to prepare us, so that we can fulfill our purpose here as being the body of Christ and standing for the Word of God. You can even read going on into uh, uh, 2 Timothy, where we, uh, or maybe 1 Timothy, where we get the instructions for, for deacons and for overseers. The King James would use the word bishop. So, so much about our church doctrine, what we're built on, comes from these two letters, 1 and 2 Timothy. But I want us to back up now to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, in which Paul gives young Timothy some very interesting instructions. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Paul said these words to Timothy, Study to show thyself approved unto God. Now I want to pause right there before we get the rest of the way. Paul uses uh, the word study in... Uh, Poor Kylie. Every, every Wednesday she comes to church and she's just got a mountain of homework that she has to do. Um, so I'm sure that the last word she wants to hear is study. But Kylie, we've got to study the Bible. The word uh, study there 
In the Greek, it's spudazo. And it actually appears several times in the Greek writings, uh, the New Testament. And one such occasion, I'm going to flip there very quickly, is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. And Paul says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And you think, I didn't see the word study in there anywhere. Well, maybe not in the English, but the Greek word, it's the same word as endeavoring. Studying the Bible, make no mistake, is an endeavor. If you remember, I was here uh, this Sunday before you called me to be your pastor, and we went through John chapter 5 and talked about an inter interesting situation when Jesus said, One day the dead will hear, there now is an hour coming when the dead will hear the, son of, the voice of the Son of God and they will live. And uh, we studied that and we looked at it and we, we, we really came to terms with that studying the Bible does take effort. It does take a, a really a dedication and a, and a, and a striving to really uh, be a good student of the Word. So don't be discouraged if you think reading the Bible is challenging. Maybe challenging both uh, to keep your eyes open the whole time or to, uh, or to understand it. Um, now, two things can be true at once. The Bible can be straightforward. I believe it is. I think if you take the Bible literally, it is very simple and straightforward. But at the same time, there's still so much to learn. There's so much to know. There's always something new that you can study. Any preacher, uh, we were uh, Wednesday night, we were talking, and I asked Brother Norman how long he's been studying the Bible. And uh, he said he can remember having Bible studies with Methuselah. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, the point being is, as Brother Norman said, he's been studying the Bible a long time, and he still has more to study and more to learn. It is a lifelong endeavor. So don't be discouraged if uh, it seems difficult. Um, it, it really is an endeavor. So that word spudazo, study, endeavor, endeavoring, it really has uh, the, the same meaning behind it. Studying takes effort. But then at the end of the verse, I want to focus on the second half of that, what Paul says. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, Paul makes an interesting statement. He wants Timothy to rightly divide. Now, let's talk about a little bit of Greek here. Uh, not, not just to show off my great knowledge of the Greek that I looked up on the internet, but, but to really get to a point. The Greek word for rightly divide is one word. Uh, it's orthotomeo. Orthotomeo. And it's a combination of two Greek words. Don't, don't leave me here because I brought up Greek words again. I have a point behind this. It's a combination of two Greek words. Orthos and tomos. Orthos and tomos. The word orthos appears in Acts chapter 14, verse 10, in which Paul healed the lame man in Lystra. And, and, and to sum it up, Paul tells the man to, to stand up straight. To stand up straight. You ever, have, ever told a kid that? Boy, has your dad ever told you to sit up straight? <laughs> uh, so, so, so the idea of, of standing up straight, this word orthos, it means exactly that. Straight, upright. Then the word tomos, it actually appears only once in the Bible. And you actually know where it shows up. And uh, I may not quote it perfectly in the King James. I am formally a, uh, a HCSBer, the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Uh, so sometimes I may quote things and it may come out in the Holman Christian Standard, but very close to the same thing. Uh, for the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. The word sharper there is Tomas. And, and that word sharp, it's much more specific than just uh, cutting. Uh, you know, it's not like you're hacking at something trying to chop a tree down. It really means a precise surgical cut. That's what that word tomos means. So we have ortho tomeo, orthos tomos, combining to give us this Greek word. The word really means truly that they combine to mean a straight cut. Cut straightly. Cut precisely. And I would say, unfortunately, many modern translations fail to transliterate that word. Transliterate means just let the word mean what it means. 
Um, so often, your translations, if they are uh, for not a King James, um, and there's a few other translations, but you don't ever use them, like the Darby or the Young's Literal or the Webster. Um, yeah, did you know that Webster has a Bible translation? If you are not using a King James, uh, if you have something like the NIV, the ESV, the NASB, something like that, your Bible probably says something like rightly handling, doesn't it? Or maybe uh, uh, rightly teaching, something along those lines. The problem with that is the translators of that Bible, whichever new modern translation you have, they interpreted that word orthotomeo. The King James translators just, they, they just translated it. They just took it from Greek and put it in English. Orthotomeo, what does that mean? It means rightly divide. It means a straight cut, dividing the Bible rightly. But your translators of a modern translation, they decided, you know what, we're not going to translate that. We're going to interpret it. What do we think Paul means? Paul means, uh, ah, he means to rightly handle it. He means to teach it correctly. That's what he means. Well, the problem with interpretations are, guess what? They're man's opinion. They're man's opinion at the end of the day. We want to know what the Word of God says. And the most accurate translation of orthotomeo is rightly dividing. Now, the question is, why would Paul instruct Timothy to rightly divide the Bible? To, 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 be, to be very literal in the Word, why is there a need to make straight cuts in the Word of God? That almost sounds kind of, uh, kind of wrong, doesn't it? You need to cut the Bible, and you need to cut it straight. Uh, don't, don't take out a pair of scissors and start cutting the Bible up. We don't want to uh, do a uh, ben, Benjamin Franklin over here, if you've ever heard of the Ben Franklin Bible. He cut out all the miraculous things uh, in Scripture. Um, but yet Paul says so to rightly divide the word of truth, to make a straight cut. So this may sound like a bad thing, but what if, let's just ask that question for a second, what if the Bible actually has divisions in it? Because if the Bible has divisions in it, there would be a need to rightly divide it. And what if one area of the Bible is talking about one particular thing and another area of the Bible is talking about an entirely different thing? Is that possible? In which case, if that really is true, if there are parts of the Bible that is dedicated to one thing and other parts of the Bible dedicated to another thing, we very much do have a need to rightly divide the word of truth. So, so the question I want to ask us today is, is, is are there places in the Bible where we see the Bible talking about different things? Are, are there times in the Bible where we see really distinct differences that we need to look at and say, hold on now, I think that maybe the Bible's talking about this over here, but over here it's talking about this. And we don't need to confuse these two things. We don't need to mix them up. And it may be possible on the surface where the Bible may appear to have contradictions. You ever had that attack before? You ever been debating somebody who's an atheist or doesn't really believe the Bible and they want to say, oh, the Bible has contradictions in it. And you say, no, it doesn't. It doesn't have any contradictions. It's the inerrant, perfect Word of God. And they say, well, what about this? And you think, well, it's not a contradiction. It, it sure seems like one, but it's not one. And you, you, you kind of maybe get stumped a little bit. It's, it's happened to me before. And it may be possible that the Bible appears to have some contradictions. Let's look at uh, apparent contradiction, what seems to be a contradiction in the Word of God. Let's go to Leviticus, chapter 4. Everybody's favorite book of the Bible, right? Leviticus, chapter 4, verse 13. We're going to read down to verse 20. Here's what it says. And if the whole congregation of Israel sin through ignorance, and the thing be hid from the eyes of the assembly, and they have done something, uh, or they have done somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which should not be done and are guilty. All right, a lot of words there. If Israel sinned and they've gone against the law, when the sin which they have sinned against it is known, 
then the congregation shall offer a young bullock for the sin and bring him before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands upon the head of the bullock before the Lord, and the bullock shall be killed before the Lord. And the priest that is anointed shall bring of the bullock's blood to the tabernacle of the congregation. And the elders of the, um, and the priest that is anointed, oh, I skipped verse 15. And the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands upon the head of the bullock before the Lord, and the bullock shall be killed before the Lord. And the priest that is anointed shall bring of the bullock's blood to the tabernacle of the congregation, and the priest shall dip his finger in some of the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord, even before the veil. I'm going to pause for a moment. Just notice all the particular instructions of what is to be done here, okay? There's some detail going on. They're, they're given very specific instructions. Verse 18, And he shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar, which is before the Lord, that is in the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall pour out all the blood at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he shall take all his fat from him and burn it upon the altar. And he shall do with the bullock as he did with the bullock for a sin offering, so shall he do with this, and the priest shall make an atonement for them. So all these very specific instructions concerning the law, right? And read the very last phrase. And it shall be forgiven them. Now, let's do a good practice of taking the Bible for what it says. If Israel followed these instructions exactly as they were told, starting from verse 13, working down, and they offered this bullock as a sin offering, would God forgive their sins? This is not a trick question. What would the answer be? Yes, God would forgive their sins. God gave very specific instructions, okay? Keep this in mind. So there's Leviticus chapter 4 saying, if Israel sinned, a bullock for a sin offering was to be given, and they would be forgiven of sins. Now, with that being said, Let's go to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, and let's go to verses 15 and 16. Y'all may beat me there. I'm not doing very good on the Bible competition. Galatians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. Let's read what Paul says here. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. Now, Paul, in a sense, could be talking about himself, Barnabas, those who may be with him that are actually Jewish. Verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Okay? It's interesting what Paul says here. Man's not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, you and I would say, Amen. We are justified by faith in Christ. We are not justified by works of the law. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. And then he says at the end, For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Paul says there, there is no forgiveness, no justification for sins in the law. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Now, Let's be honest with ourselves. Does Galatians 2, 16 agree with Leviticus chapter 4, verse 20? No, they don't. It seems on the surface. On the surface, it seems that, those are com that, that, that Paul is completely denying what Leviticus chapter 4, verse 20 says. And to a degree, he is. Now, my question is, is this a contradiction in the Bible? No, it is not. The reason why is because in the days of the nation of Israel, when they were under the law, if they wanted to be forgiven of a sin, they had to bring a sin offering. Remember, we talked about this last Sunday. When were they forgiven of their sins versus when we were forgiven of our sins? They had to seek forgiveness through offering sacrifices in the law. It was the sacrificial system. You and I do not operate under the sacrificial system. We do not offer a sacrifice to receive forgiveness. Our forgiveness is found in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We place faith in what Christ has done. That is how you and I are forgiven. So what appears to be a contradiction, and some preachers get confused by this, because they'll say, well, 
Even though Leviticus 4.20 said that if you offer a sacrifice, you'll be forgiven, that's not really what it means. It doesn't, doesn't actually say that. If you ever hear a preacher say the Bible doesn't actually mean that, just go somewhere else. <laughs> go to a football game. It'd be better for you to go to a football game than to listen to preachers say the Bible doesn't actually say that. Because the Bible actually says that. So what's going on? Israel was under the dispensation of the law. You and I are under the dispensation of grace. What do we have to do to make sure that we don't get confused? How about we rightly divide the word of truth and say, Ah, Leviticus 4.20 is talking about the nation of Israel under the law. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16 is talking about the age of grace that you and I live in today. Where there is no sacrificial system, there's already been the ultimate sacrifice. Christ, the Lamb of God, that takes away the sins of the world. So we don't make that mistake. So that's absolutely true. There are no contradictions in the Bible. Where there appear to be, it's man's confusion. If we can learn to rightly divide the Bible... All these challenges, these, these issues with Scripture that may seem to have contradictions or confusion, it simply goes away. There is a freedom that we are going to find as we move forward in rightly dividing the Bible that is going to clear so many things up for us. Where there's so much confusion in Christianity, so much confusion in understanding the Bible, we're going to see all of a sudden how the Bible becomes so straightforward because we are going to simply take the Bible for what it says and just let Scripture tell us what it means. Not inserting our own opinions, not ins inserting the commentaries of the professors at the seminary. You and I are just going to read the Bible. I have one last example I want to point to you. Let's go to, uh, let's go to the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, and I want to go to verse 9. Mark chapter 16, verse 9. Now, do you notice here at Mark chapter 16, verse 9, there's a little, does anybody have a little bit of a line by that verse in their Bible? And then probably down at verse 19, there's another little line by the verse there. Let's read that passage, and I'm going to tell you why that, those little lines in your Bible are there. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Uh, that's a lot of devils. That's not really the point of my passage, but it's quite a few. Um, and she went and told them that had been hid with him, or that had been with him, as they mourned and wept. And they, when they heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. It's interesting. Disciples didn't know that he was supposed to be raised again. Didn't understand that. Um, after that, he had appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue. Neither believed they them. And afterward, he appeared unto the leaven as they said at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen, of him, uh, seen him after he was risen. Now, so far you may think, what's the problem here? I like... What's the point you're getting at? We, we all heard this. Let's pay attention to these last few verses. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and set on the right hand of God. Now, once again, I said you had brackets there by those verses. Verses 9 and 16, most likely you do. Here's the reason why. This is supposedly, you may have a little footnote in your Bible. You may have a footnote that says, the oldest manuscripts don't contain these verses. Some of you don't because you all have a good Bible. But some of your Bibles may say, the oldest, the best, the early witnesses do not record these verses, this passage in the Gospel of Mark. The reality is the postmodern scholars who want to reject anything miraculous 
the modern professor seminaries uh, or seminary professors, they want to reject these verses. Why? Because they don't really sound a whole lot like us today, does it? First of all, do we have to be baptized in order to be saved? Because according to that, you've got to believe and be baptized. Because if you, him that, him that believeth not shall be damned. So if you're not baptized, does that only get you halfway there? What about the rest of it? In my name shall they cast out devils. Now maybe you've had to beat something out of your child before, but probably not casting out devils, I would assume. What about this? Speaking in new tongues? We don't hold to that. What about taking up serpents? I will say, in my first church, I, d I did handle a few snakes in the church, but that was because they kept sneaking through the door. Drink any deadly thing, and it shall not hurt them. Lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. My point is, scholars, the experts at the seminaries, they have found some very, and we may go into this, some very questionable manuscripts that are supposedly pretty old that happen to have omitted some of those verses. So you know what they do? Even though we have thousands and thousands of copies all saying the same thing, they find a couple little verses that want to line up with what they believe, what they would like it to say. So they put brackets in your Bible and tell you that the oldest and best manuscripts don't have it, which causes you to question the Word of God and think, huh, maybe it shouldn't be in there. Maybe I can't really trust that. You'll find that about the, uh, the woman caught in adultery. You're going to find this in a number of verses in the Bible, the book of Revelation, a number of places where there's brackets in your Bibles where the scholars, the, uh, the experts... Remember a few years ago when you were told to trust all those experts? Turned out that they didn't really know what they were talking about for the most part, or entirely. It's because they are looking for a reason to get rid of those problematic verses because those experts, those scholars, they take the Bible and they don't rightly divide it. They try to force everything into big, making it about you and me. And so whenever they see a verse that doesn't line up with us and the church today, they want to completely omit it and throw it out. But if you read in the Bible, did you know that Paul was bit by a snake, by a serpent, and he was fine? That sounds a whole lot like the Gospel of Mark. Did you know that they spoke in tongues, they cast out devils, that they laid hands on the sick and healed them, the apostles did in the book of Acts? They did all those things. They'll say, well, it doesn't fit with the, with the style of writing and the, and the narrative of Mark. It just seems to be added in. That, that is your opinion, and you're just trying to justify a reason to omit part of the Word of God. If we could learn to rightly divide and separate, ah, this is not about us. That's first century Jewish apostles confirming their ministry that Christ gave to them. But because a few so-called experts want to edit our Bibles... Do you realize that your NIV that you have or your NASB is on what was the some 20th or so revision of these updated texts? The King James doesn't have those things. There's no footnotes in my Bible saying the oldest and best manuscripts say this. Because my King James Bible is not based upon an edited, altered, revised, changed version of the Bible. This is based upon the Greek text, which we have thousands and thousands of copies. We call it the received text. In the Greek, the textus receptus. Now this is my commercial for you to go out and buy a King James Bible. I don't require it. But uh, I strongly encourage it. It's kind of like, kind of consider it one of those, uh, those optional practices your coaches did. You know, if you want to come practice, we're going to meet at the gym at such and such time. But you knew if you really wanted to play. <laughs> Believe it or not, I, I, I'll be honest with you. As I was prepping this sermon when I got to this portion of it, you ever get so mad that you kind of, you start to shake a little bit? Uh, it might have been that or the whole pot of coffee I drank. I don't know. But I got a little hot under the collar because there are preachers, because they're hearing it from the big box seminaries, the big scholars, the big theologians that, well, the oldest and best manuscripts don't contain Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 19. 
and they'll, 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 they, will, they will say that. And I have heard preachers from the mouse that live in a town not very far from here that say that those verses are not a part of the Bible. And so he didn't preach over it. He didn't preach from the Word of God because some experts told him that it wasn't a part of the Bible. I wish that preachers would have the backbone to stand up for the Bible and quit letting them change it and omit it over and over again and just listen to Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 and learn how to rightly divide the Word of truth. Amen. There's an old school Southern Baptist preacher that comes out in me every now and then. So with that being said, how about we have a little bit of guts as preachers. I'm talking to the preachers in the room, Brother Norman. <laughs> the only one I know of. So if any preachers are listening, and you as well, let's have some backbone and quit letting people change the Word of God. Amen. I really do encourage you, go out and get you a King James Bible. The New King James is based upon the Textus Receptus too, but... I think you can learn to read the ye's and the these and the thou's and whatnots. But understand, please, that if you have a modern translation, your Bible has been edited and changed by experts that do not believe in the miraculous events that the Bible says. And they look for any reason to throw them out. Whenever we can learn to rightly divide the word of truth, as Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.15, you're going to learn this is the key to sound Bible doctrine. Through right division, we are going to learn, and we're going to, we're going to go forward with this, and you're going to see all of this. We are going to avoid, avoid theological train wrecks because so many, so many Christians, that they deal with those things, and they don't realize because they can't rightly divide, they are causing so much confusion in the churches. We are going to prevent making the error of mixing what is prophetic in the Old Testament versus what is mystery for the age that you and I live in. We're going to be able to um, avoid, evade the name it and claim it theology. Reading in the book, oh, that's mine, and that's mine, and that's mine. Well, hold on, not so fast. Did you rightly divide that? Can you know for sure that it's yours? We're going to stop devaluing Jesus' sacrifice. Because guess what? We're complete in Him. Colossians tells us that. There's nothing to add to the work of Christ. We're going to resolve all the apparent contradictions in Scripture, and we're also going to understand the end times. Eschatology, as my Sunday school class students are learning. Moving forward, we are going to study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that needeth not ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we are going to stand on the Word of God and anybody who tries to alter it, change it, claim that it's not really saying what it's saying, we're going to have the courage to stand up to them and tell them, uh, how, do I, how do I say this nicely, hush up. <laughs> because here at Blue Baptist Church, we're going to be a church that stands on the Word of God. We're going to study it carefully, endeavor it. And we're going to rightly divide it. Because we live in a dispensation of the grace of God that was hid in ages before, that was hid in God before the world began. That you and I now can come to salvation by grace through faith and not of works, lest anyone should boast. If you haven't been saved today, you can receive that gift freely, not by works of the law, but by grace in trusting in what Christ has done. And we're going to stand on that as long as I have anything to do with it, and I have a feeling as long as you have anything to do with it too. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for this opportunity we have to study your word. God, your word is clear. It's clear. It's unchanged. There's no need to update it. There's no need to alter it to make it fit with our understanding. If we would just take the Bible for what it says, take it literally, trust it, Lord, we would see that it speaks for itself. God, that we live in a time that was not foreseen previously, Lord, where previously you were working with the nation of Israel. God, now you're working with individuals. And each person has that opportunity, whether or not they're going to hear, listen, and believe in the gospel of grace that we have today. Thank you for your Savior. Thank you for all that you have done, all that you will do in the future, Lord. Thank you for your word. May we never compromise on it. May this be the hill that we're always going to be willing to die on. Lord, we love you, we praise you. We call these things in Jesus' name. Amen.